two forwards, two guards, and a center. And here's what shook out here, according to 100 voters. Damian Lillard, James Harden, Durant, Anthony Davis, and LeBron James setting a new record here, guys. Incredible. <laughs> Obviously, we know what he's done, and we'll wait yeah. to see where he falls in the MVP yeah. race. But what impresses you most about what LeBron's been able to do this year? Incredible. His durability. Yes. I mean, for him to be uh, 33 years old, and we both know playing at 33 years old and, and the amount of minutes that he has to play yeah. and pretty much have to put his team on his back, not just by just scoring, but by passing and rebounding. And, and sometimes that's tough. Sometimes guys can take a night off because they got another guy that can step up and win that game for them. But he's the guy that stepped up each and every game and putting that team on the shoulder. Okay, let's go to one of the newcomers here as, as we see LeBron, who's now setting the record here for most. How many miles on these passing right now? <laughs> Incredible, right? Yeah, you, if you look at, like, say, people on this list, you talk about Tony Bryan, who was an exceptional player, Carl Malone, who we know didn't miss many games as well. Uh, as you said earlier, the durability that these players show to get to this point in their, in their, in their careers, right. it lets you know that they take care of their bodies. But LeBron, I mean, the milestones that he passed this year are some milestones that I never would have thought yeah. would have been passed. But he takes care of himself, and he has to do everything for the team, rebounding, getting assists, making right. sure he has the right defensive assignment, and making all the plays so his team can get easier shots. And he really has, he hasn't, he's missed out on not having another playmaker. Yes. To take and relieve some of that pressure right now, and I think that's made it tougher for him. And we see him in, in doing certain periods of the game where he's getting tired. Those legs are not there to make shots and drive to the basket. All right, what do you think about who got snubbed, right? Who's going to be upset that's not on the first team? All NBA list. We already know. Yeah. Russell Westbrook. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the That's man averaged the man yes. averaged a triple double back-to-back right. -back season, and you telling me he cannot get on the All First NBA team? I'm shocked. Well, you know, there's a rule, right? Because there's only two guards allowed in the All NBA First Team. So if you got to put Russell on, who's coming off? Well, that's the hard thing that we can say because Damian Lillard had a great year. But when you're talking about a man that just went out and averaged a triple double, it is so hard to get a triple double in a game. I didn't have one my whole entire career. Neither did I. Let alone he won the MVP last year, and now he pretty much came out and doubled down and did it again, and you're telling me he is, he is not a first-team All-NBA guy? That's crazy to me. Well, did you have Lillard and James Harden above Russell Westbrook in your MVP voting? No. You didn't? Okay, well, interesting. Let's look at the second team now. And uh, by the way, here's Russell Westbrook. He is on the second team along with DeMar DeRozan. You got Giannis Antetokounmpo, LaMarcus Aldridge, and Joel Embiid, his very first selection, Tony. And these guys have earned it. If you yes. look at Joel Embiid, he's a player that played through a lot of injuries early on, and he became a much better player. And just the way he's able to knock down shots from the outside, he can put the ball on the floor, and he has a great personality that the fans have all enjoyed. But just how he approaches the game and just taking his team to the playoff, which they haven't been in many years, you know, he was worth the wait. As the process was starting, he was the main, uh, main ingredient in the process, and he showed everyone the reason why he is one of the elite players in the league. Uh, let's go to the third team now and show you what that list looks like of guys who, who maybe you, you like or you don't like. We're going to pop that up for you here in a moment. I promise. It's coming. It's coming. Here it comes. Show them what you got. It's two guys from Minnesota on there. Yeah, that's right. Jimmy Butler and Carl Anthony Towns on there. Steph Curry on the third team as well. Uh, what would you think? Because of the number of games, is that why Curry's down to the third team? Should he have made it at all? Well, like I said, it's, it, it's, it's, it's a number of games that he has, has missed. Same thing with Kyrie Irving, because I thought Kyrie Irving should have been on the first team. He would have been. Until he got hurt. And the same thing, uh, I thought that Jimmy Butler was great for that team. He kind of got them guys over the hump, especially when you got two young guys with Wiggins and Carl Anthony Towns, guys that, do, just, that just don't know how to win. But he was a guy that came back and he was pretty much the key factor on the reason why they were able to get to that playoff spot. And he also brought a toughness that that team didn't have, and, I, and it was a player that Tib could trust. And when you bring a veteran in, mm -hmm. it's to uplift the right. younger players. What do you think about Victor Oladipo in the season he had? Third team, the right spot for him? Should he be on the second team, or should he have not made it among the top six guards at all? No, I thought he should have been on the sec second team. I mean, his, this season was incredible for him. I don't think there was a man in, that watched the NBA and thought that he was going to come out there and have an impact, uh, probably a bigger impact than Paul George had the year before that. But he kind of found his niche. I don't know if it's because he's back in Indiana where he went to college. Or, or maybe it was Westbrook, leaving Westbrook and maybe getting some more attempts. But he showed that he yes. was a good player on the defensive end as well as being their go-to player, and he had a, an exceptional playoff. Yes.
All right, well, the playoffs roll on as the award season also continues. We'll talk more about West Game 5 as we got that coming up a little later on. Jason Tatum, in the Eastern Conference, man, a man, 20 years old, and leading the Boston Celtics to within a game of the NBA Finals. How's he doing it? That's what we call hot take predictions by the starter. Someone's winning tonight. Big game requires a big broadcaster. And that's why Shaq is in the building, along with the entire TNT crew in Houston tonight. Game 5 of the Western Conference Finals. There's Ernie Johnson, along with his entire security detail. Watch, he's got personnel all around him. Don't touch, don't touch her. PK's got him. We are two hours from tip-off at Toyota Center. Chris Paul coming off his best game of the series. Will this be the final game of the series in Houston? Or is this best of three going the distance? Well, Steph Curry would like to win the next two and make it a six-game series. Steph says, we've got to be us. But here's the question. Will Steph's splash brother be in the lineup? Injury concerns, topic number one tonight, as we are with you with a pair of NCAA and NCAA tournament most outstanding players. Tony Dell, back in uh, 96. We've got Griff Hamilton back in 99. You guys are old. I'm Jared Greenberg. Uh, well, well, Jared, we appreciate that. Well, who are you going with, the Connecticut team or the Kentucky team? Well, I grew up in the Northeast, so sorry, Tony. Okay. Oh, Bam, ooh, there you okay go. Okay, then. All right. All I appreciate right. that, brother. But, but Rip know who will win, though. Hey. So he, he, he already knows hey, that 96 team. Hey, that was pretty good, but yeah. I don't know if y'all can beat us, but no. I love y'all team, too. <laughs> <laughs> Look at this. I love it. Uh, this is game time. We're going to break down uh, the all-NBA teams, which have been announced today. Plus, we'll look ahead to game six in the Eastern Conference Finals. We know we got a long series there. Uh, we got you for the next 60 minutes, leading right into TNT's pregame coverage of game five of the Western Conference Finals. First, let's look at the storylines from our game four the other night. Over the last two games, Steph Curry has scored a total of 35 points in the third quarter alone, shooting 7 of 10 from three-point territory. However, in the game four loss, Curry missed seven of his eight shots in the fourth quarter, which was a big problem. Curry's struggles were compounded by Chris Paul's brilliance. Tuesday night, the future Hall of Famer scored 8 of his 27 in the fourth as the Rockets stormed back from 12 down to win the game and tie the series, but not before some very unwarrior like execution. Kevin Durant has since said that he wishes he could have this possession back. Clay got stuck in the quarter. Steve Kerr claimed the refs didn't see Draymond Green signaling for timeout. And Golden State saw its win streak of 16 straight home playoff games come to an end. Now, here's a look at the numbers behind the Dubs collapse and the Rockets comeback, no matter how you want to look at it here. Golden State extended its lead to 12 with 10.45 to go in the fourth, but then over the rest of the game made just two shots from the field. It's not like the Rockets were scorching hot either. Houston hit just under 37% from the field. Uh, however, the Rockets dominated the paint and the glass and made the Western Conference Finals a best of three series. You can't just rely on your talent. When a team's getting into you and they're putting pressure on you and they're switching everything, you got to execute. It's the basics, it's the fundamentals, getting open, and, uh, better passing, better ball movement. Um, but it all starts with uh, the force with which you play. Standing and waiting for a ball 30 feet from the hoop, which we were all doing, that's not playing with force. All right, so not much panic there from the Warriors as we bring a guy who never panics, Stephen Field, Seku Smith, NBA.com, and the Hangtime Podcast. Seku, joining us tonight courtside from Houston. All right, let, let's begin here with the obvious, the injury concerns for Clay Thompson and for Andre Iguodala. What's the latest you're hearing? The latest we're hearing that, uh, you know, Clay is definitely going to play. Um, you know, and that Iguodala is still, a, you know, to be determined, Jared. It's, it's, it's strange, you know, how different a team they are without Iguodala out there, you know, to kind of calm things down. But Steve Kerr has spoken to that, and, uh, and it showed up, you know, pretty evident at the end of game four, not having him out there, what kind of impact that had on the Warriors at the end of that game. Danny, he mentioned t today uh, about the roster imbalance where they don't have a plethora of wings or guards to go to when guys get injured or in foul trouble. So, so is he going to turn to a big he hasn't used, or, or what does he expect from guys where he's got a lot of depth at up front? Yeah, I don't think you should, you know, should expect to see Zaza Chulia or, you know, or anybody like that. I think it's going to still be that same rotation of guys. Um, you know, Bell and, and certainly Looney are going to have to play big roles. They're going to have to play better. They're going to have to play better, more quality minutes than what we saw from them in game four. But Steve Kerr is convinced, you know, and, and I think, you know, they, his staff, they study all the, the numbers and everything else. The matchups, you know, tell them that they have to stick with what they've 
been doing so far. You can't change right now and expect to have success against a Rockets team that of all the teams in the league that they could be dealing with, this is one that, that doesn't mind the Warriors going to a smaller lineup because they can match up and play that way as well. Yeah, a lot of pressure in, in game four on the Rockets backward, seeing if they were able to overcome their playoff demons. Not only did they do that, do that but they overcame the Warriors, a double-digit lead. So when you go to game five here now, back at home, and James Harden, who, who didn't have a great game but played well in the first half the other night, what is expected of him to pick up the slack tonight? It was a huge game for him. And, you know, we talk about the, the Warriors and how every game builds on this dynasty and, and what their legacies are going to be. Well, th this is a game for, for James Harden and, to a lesser extent, Chris Paul changes a legacy. You know, if James Harden can dial up an MVP-like performance today, that gives him another notch in his belt to kind of wipe away the smear that he's had from his previous stints in the playoffs. Everybody talks about his 2012 flameout when he was with the Thunder, and obviously last year against the Spurs when he just ran out of you know ran out of glass completely. People look at that and want to criticize him and take apart his game because of what they saw then. This is an opportunity for him to get rid of some of that and to start a new narrative. All right, Sekou Smith, NBA.com. He'll be covering the game for you tonight from Houston. Thanks for joining us, buddy. Thanks, Jerry. All right, let's get to tonight's limelight stats. They're presented by Corona Extra. We'll take a look at the Warriors and the way their offense is operated against the Spurs and the Pelicans and then how it's operated over the first four games of this series against the Rockets. And, and let's say this, too. Right, Houston's a better defensive team than a lot of people want them credit for. Maybe they have a lot to do with this year. Is that the case? Is it more about Houston, or is it more about the Warriors getting away rip from their identity? Well, I definitely think Houston has better defenders, and especially better defenders on the perimeter. When you got guys like P.J. Tucker that sometimes plays the four position and, and is able to go out there and switch on a Steph Curry, it, it allows them to still stay connected and still stick to their principles. So if you watch some of these plays right here, especially late in the game when Steph Curry got the ball, you see Capella, he gets up and he tries to take away his airspace because if Steph Curry has any type of weakness, it's getting to the basket and finishing over a bigger guy. So Capella does a great job of staying low, staying connected, and staying to his body. Again, if you watch Klay Thompson right now catching the ball this far away from the basketball, he's not the type of player that wants to go ahead and make a play off a dribble penetration. He wants to come off a pin down, get a curl, and get a wide open shot like that. Now they have to hurry up, push, uh, force the ball to KD, and he got to take a pressure shot with four seconds left on the shot clock. Again, same thing with Steph Curry right here. He hasn't been able to get shots off pin downs, off dribble handoffs. So what they try to do is try to find a matchup that he can create and make a playoff. But James Harden, again, does a great job taking out, taking out way his way airspace, forces him to drive, but Steph doesn't want to drive every time, so he settles for a bad three-point shot. So I think Houston Rockets got defenders, guys that can really get up right. in guys and take away guys what, what guys like to do on the offensive end. And, and when they built this team around James Harden, they had to have guys that make sure they hide his weaknesses. Mm -hmm. But when he's uh, guarding Kevin Durant, you know, because of respect, he's going to play a lot harder. You saw, saw when he picked him from the half court uh, at the NBA three-point line, he was able to go down and get a layup. But I just think the way the toughness that they have with Tucker, Reza, CP3, those guys are looking forward to a matchup with anyone. They are not concerned about if it's Steph, if it's Clay. It doesn't matter. But th didn't James Harden show us the other night, though, that, that the effort can be there, right? Like, you don't have to be the best defender in the world if you put in that effort on both ends. But he respects the guy he's guarding. Mm -hmm. So if he's ever switched off on KD or Steph, He's going to get down in the stands. You're going to see him play much better defense than he would be on someone he doesn't respect or someone who's not going at him. Right. So you can't really, when you get to the final four teams, it's all about execution, but also your players have to be ready to play defense because you can't be looking for someone to help. That helps. That, that starts to get rotations, and before you know it, you're going to give up a layup or a three-point shot. We'll, we'll watch that tonight and see if he's playing defense every possession the way James Harden did the other night. We got more from Game 5 in Houston coming up in a bit. We'll return and get into the best of the best, the top 15 players, well, kind of, the All-NBA teams announced in the 17-18 season. Who's got beef? 